Before we start, may I acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Aora Nation, the traditional custodians of this land, and pay my respects to the elders, both past and present. In the spirit of welcome, I'd also like to welcome one of our new close friends to the gallery, the General Curator of Heritage and Director of the Musée de Cluny, Elisabeth Tabouret de la Haye. We're going to have a very relaxed and hopefully informal um, conversation together. Um, about some of the key things that we've considered in relation to the lady and the unicorn. But I'd like to just give you a little bit of background about Elizabeth because she is regarded as one of the foremost scholars of the Middle Ages. Um, and she has been at the helm of the Cluny in Paris since 2005. An art historian, Elizabeth was conserv conservator of heritage from 1991 holder of a DEA, or what we might call a, a Master's of Art History in 87, and then her doctorate in 1989. She was curator of the Musée de Cluny, Musée National du Moyen-Âge, where she now is the director, in the 1980s, where she was working on the Goldwork collection, in fact. Uh, she published her book on that, the Gothic Goldsmith Works from the 13th to the beginning of the 15th century, uh, at the Cluny in 1989. And of course, Elizabeth, for those of you who aren't aware, Elizabeth has gone on to write many, many, many scholarly texts um, with all sorts of extraordinary people uh, on the t terms of, the goth of Gothic art and of art and nature um, and various other subjects in between. Elizabeth was then at the Louvre where she was responsible for several exhibitions as curator, including a joint exhibition on limousine, uh, limousine enamel, um, that went with the, uh, to the ne New York Metropolitan in 1995, and the exhibition Paris 1400, The Arts Under Charles VI in 2004, at which point she became responsible for the scientific and artistic profile of the new Le Louvre Lens Museum. The Louvre Lens, for those of you who aren't aware, was a museum built by the same team who will be building the art gallery's new building in the next couple of years, SANA. Um, and at the end of 2005, as I said before, she succeeded the late Vivian Huchard as the director of the Cluny. Elizabeth is a member of the Society of Antiquaries in France, um, the Central Union of Decorative Arts, uh, the Commission of National Monuments, uh, Historic Monuments. But in that time, she's also devoted herself to teaching um, much of the time, including at the Ecole du Louvre. I suspect as such Elizabeth will today teach us much about the mysteries of the lady and the unicorn. So we are delighted to have you here and have a conversation. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thanks to you. Thank you very much. So I, I think um, just now you said to me that were it up to you in this, uh, with this weather today that you would likely be at the beach. <laughs> No, I, I, I mean, I'm surprised that yeah. so many people are here instead of being at the beach. That's right. Because, you know, in France, we think that people who, have the, who are lucky enough to live in this wonderful city, in this wonderful country, spend their life outside <laughs> and not inside the museum. So that's why I'm so surprised. Well, indeed. And I think that I guess this is perhaps the start of our questions together. Um, why are these people here, do you think? I mean, what is it that draws people to the lady and the unicorn, I'm, rather than actually going out in 30 degree heat outside? What do you think it is to, to exhibit it in this environment in mm. Sydney, do you think? Yes, in fact, I would say that my question, I would be very much interested by your answer. Uh. But I can try to say what were well, our feelings with the team in the Musée de Cluny including uh, our Secretary General Marie-France Cocheteau, who is here today too, when we began to work with your team, with Maud Page, with you, Jackie, and uh, uh, other colleagues in this museum. You know, that's just a mix of circumstances. Mm -hmm. As it has been said, the Lady and the Unicorn is our, our masterpiece, our Joconde, mm -hmm. and we don't think about lending it abroad. Uh, we landed it uh, three years ago, 
no, four years ago, mm. to Japan because we were having uh, works in the room to renovate the room in which the tapestries are exhibited. So during the works, it was good to have it uh, mm. uh, somewhere else. And here again, for other works, we will close the, completely the museum during four months. So as some years ago, we thought maybe it would be a good opportunity to show the tapestries to other people to help people who live far away mm -hmm. to discover those masterpieces. And for us, uh, the question of the distance is not really um, major, yeah. but we think it's interesting to both help people to offer the possibility mm -hmm. to discover this piece of art which is not really uh, well known, mm -hmm. but also for us to try to understand how it can touch and interest people who have so different mm -hmm. uh, interest in culture, in way of life, mm -hmm. uh, nowadays, such a distance in geography mm -hmm. and in time. Yeah, it's interesting because in fact, the it's normal, it's usual home in the Musée de Cluny is right at the heart of Paris, but also, if you like, at the heart of uh, Gothic Paris. Mm -hmm. So a very, very different environment and architectural, um, cultural space. Um, can you tell me just a little bit about, before we move in towards the tapestries mm -hmm. themselves, a little bit about uh, the way you, that you feel about the Cluny and its, its mm -hmm. presence in Paris? Mm -hmm. So, the Musée de Cluny was created in 1843. Uh, it was so, and the first part of 19th century. The Louvre has existed for half a century, a little more at this period. And it was a time during which creation of museums was I would say on the track, <laughs> but not so uh, numerous than it has been in the second half of the 19th century. And it was also a mix of circumstances. Uh, in this very center of Paris, it still existed ruins of Roman baths. Mm. Uh, it existed a medieval building, which mm. has been erected next to the Roman baths at the end of 15th century and scholars, amateurs, were beginning to be interested in those periods, to be interested in archeology, span in uh, historical background of those monuments, and amateurs, the same ones or other ones, were also beginning to be interested in collecting pieces of art. Yes. And one of those, whose name was uh, Alexandre du Somra, decided to rent an apartment inside the Hotel de Cluny. Ah. We say hotel uh, uh. as a city residence. Mm. And so he had a small apartment inside this uh, medieval building. And his collection was settled inside. Mm. And when he died, the French state, uh, encouraged by this group of amateur historians, archaeologists, mm. decided to buy um, the building mm and the collection. Mm -hmm. And that's how the museum was created, mm -hmm. in the very heart of Paris. Mm -hmm. And in this period, it was clearly distinguished. This new museum, devoted to antiquity, Middle Ages, but also later on periods, mm -hmm. from the big museum, which was, the, and is still, mm -hmm. the Louvre. Mm -hmm. And it was said the Louvre is a big, you know, that was the period during which museums were uh, devoted to show pieces of art for everyone, but especially for artists as models. Mm -hmm. And the Louvre was considered as the mod place which shows models for painters, for great artists. And Cluny, more smaller, more uh, intimate, mm -hmm. was devoted to Goldsmith's work, uh, um, Artisans, what we yes. call, uh, how do you say artisan? Well, cra a craftsperson. Yes, exactly. An artisan, yes. And so that was a clear distinction, mm. which we still mm. go on with. We still have the, we still are persuaded that it existed big museum in the big city which Paris is, but that Parisian and tourists need also smaller places, more intimate ones, to discover art in a different manner, mm -hmm. with less people, 
smaller spaces, yes. but more direct contact yes. with the pieces of art. And that's what we try to do inside the museum. Mm -hmm. That's what, what we try to do with the Lady and the Unicorn, yes. especially. Yes. And that's what I discovered. We also have succeeded <laughs> here in this uh, new we, show. I think we were in, hoping to keep Sydney. a little of the yeah. spirit of the Clooney. And it's true that something about getting up close and intimate mm. is, also reflects the domestic environment where they may have been yes. originally staged, yes. perhaps. Um, but. Uh, Maybe you can tell me a little bit about their entry then into the museum, the tapestries, and the story of that. Yeah. Because mm. um, uh, certainly they, they've been sited, in fact, in the same space for quite some time, although you've renovated it recently as well and had a new room created. Mm. But there is a, a quite wonderful history of, of some lobbying over mm. decades, in mm. fact, to get the tapestries into the the museum, effectively to get them mm. purchased by the state. Yeah. Um, so, yes, maybe we could have a little think about the story of their entry into this beautiful <laughs> because place. In fact, they were, the tapestries, as maybe we'll uh, discuss a little further on, were created, we think, around 1500. We don't know exactly where they were between 1500 around and the beginning of 19th century. Mm. What we know is that at the beginning of 19th century, a local uh, historian mm. uh, mentioned them in a castle in a small city named Boussac. The castle still exists. Mm. And one doesn't know exactly how they reached this castle. One, one has hypo several hypotheses with family links mm. going to this castle, anyhow. They were in this castle in the 19th century. And as I was saying, the first part of 19th century in France, like in England and other European countries, but especially France and England, there was this beginning of an interest for ancient art, mm. for um, mm. archaeology, mm. for old buildings. Mm. And uh, in France, we like to have strong institutions yeah, yes. with good and bad <laughs> sides. So mm. anyhow. Mm. Uh, it was created an institution which was named, and it's still named, uh, Inspection des Monuments Historiques. The idea was that um, specialists will go through France, different places, and uh, inspect the, uh, the buildings and decide what they should do for the state with those buildings. I think I'm going to interrupt you and remind people here that I don't think we managed that until about the 1980s in Australia. Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm not so sure that's a modern But idea. please, sorry, continue, so, Elizabeth. Uh, one of the first of those inspecteurs des monuments historiques uh, was named Prosper Mérimée. And this Prosper Mérimée uh, is maybe most known as a writer because he wrote um, novels, and some of the novels were inspiring after that uh, opera, mm. like Carmen. Mm. That's one of the most famous of his uh, works. So anyhow, Prosper Mérimée uh, went to this Boussac castle, and he saw the tapestries, and he was mm. shocked, mm. both by their beauty and by their bad condition, mm. because the bottom <laughs> parts were very damaged. He speaks about rats and danger of yes, mildew and, and mold. Apparently, they uh, were used to cover the, um, the horses during the winter right. to, to <laughs> help them, because they are wool, as, as you know. I, so it's good to be. Too. Don't don't be too afraid. They've been cleaned since then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Several right. times. <laughs> yes. So and uh, Prosperime has had also a good friend whose name is also known as a writer Swan, a woman. Uh, who was uh, Georges Sand. She had a house in uh, Nantes, not mm -hmm. far from Boussac. Mm -hmm. And both of them uh, were, uh, and, how do you say, enchanté. They liked yes, very delighted. much the They delighted. liked by the tapestries. Mm -hmm. um, Georges Sand describes them very poetically. Mm -hmm. And she said oh, that should inspire the, the, um, the artist of nowadays. And Prosper Mérimée, more uh, matter of fact, said but the state should buy them. Mm. So, as he was um, bien en cours, mm. uh, he, he spoke with, uh, uh, with the king and uh, he spoke with the uh, director de, of Musée de Cluny mm. and uh, the director of the period, uh, which name was Edmond du Somra, the very son of the 
fondateur of the museum, mm. decided to try to buy the tapestry. So it took long time. It mm. took quite 40 years to yes. acquire them because the city of Boussac first didn't want to sell them. Mm. After that, they asked for a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so there was a long discussion. And finally, in 1882, mm. the tapestries entered in the museum three years before the death of the director. Mm. That was the time, dear friend, during which the museum curators could die Yes, <laughs> the, the time, the time <laughs> that, that we Happy. could actually sort of die at our desks, <laughs> that you were in it for life. I think that's what we call tenure, and I don't think we know what that means anymore. <laughs> C'est vrai, en fait. Yeah. So, uh, so it's actually extraordinary, isn't it? Because I, my understanding is that they became uh, sort of wildly popular with the French public mm. very rapidly. I mean, they seem to have captivated people mm. from those very early days, I think. So that's a good question, and that's a question we, we just have hypothesis about. Uh -huh. I would say that when they went in Musée de Cluny, yeah. they were known and appreciated yes. by people like Prosper Mérimée, yes. Georges Sand, uh, art historian yeah. and archaeologist, but uh, they were not the most famous pieces in the museum. That's ah, very interesting yes. to know. If you look at the books on the Musée, Musée de Cluny at the period, the tapestries of the Lady and the Unicorn, of course, are mentioned as important, but not as the Joconde of the museum. Not as the Mona Lisa yeah. of the museum. And our guess is that um, this new status as a shed yes. as a masterpiece, came progressively, gradually. Yes. And one clue period probably was the reopening of the museum just after World War II. Uh, as all the museums in Paris, Musée de Cluny was closed during the war, and uh, it was uh, decided to have some renovation mm. just before reopening. Mm. And during this renovation, it was decided that the Lady and the Unicorn will have a room for itself. And it was the only group of works, or the only work, depends on mm -hmm. consider it's six works or one, it's mm -hmm. one work. Yeah. So it was the only work which deserved, for the people who decided to renovate the museum, to have its own room for itself. And I think that was very important mm -hmm. for the, re, re, the, sort the, the sort of status expanding its status yes, and its exactly, fame, of, the, of the tapestries. Yeah. And in the same period, one of the tapestries, Hearing, mm -hmm. was chosen as uh, illustration for the cover ah. of a book for young uh, people going to school. Yes, it's a very well-known school textbook, which each of the curators has spoken yeah. to me about yes, remembering from that, their childhood. Because all French people, quite all French people of my generation and a little younger ones, have studied French literature in La Gare des Michards. If mm -hmm. some French are in the audience, mm -hmm. maybe you have heard of, of La Gare des Michards. And La Gare des Michards, uh, one of the books, had one of the Lady and the Unicorn tapestries on the cover. Uh. So that's not, of course, the, the reason, but that's both, I think, um, a testimony mm -hmm. and part of the explanation of this uh, success uh, of the tapestry uh, beginning in the second half of 20th mm -hmm. century mm -hmm. and growing after that. Yeah. It's interesting that you mentioned it, uh, if this fame was really sort of growing after the World War II and its re-entry, the tapestry's re-entry into the museum, into its own space. World War II also marked, I think, one of the most important renovations that, that took no. place. But in fact, prior to that, at the end of the 19th mm -hmm. century, sorry, we say renovation, we're speaking conservation in our terms, I should say. Um, but there was a reweaving uh, yes, in the, the late photograph. 19th century, which people can see in the mm. exhibition. You'll note this slightly faded band at the bottom, which presumably is the area that may have been eaten by rats or mildewed away, we assume. But, um, so, but there have been successive conservation projects. Yes. And the most recent was at a very high-tech laboratory in, in Belgium, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, it sounds quite extraordinary. This is something you only undertake from time to time, presumably. It's a dangerous and risky thing it's to a, do. It could be risky. It could be. So, just to, um, to mention the 
first reno um, restorations of conservation projects. Yes, in the 19th century, as you said, the bottom parts were very much damaged. And so there was first a um, replacement with painting and a few years after a replacement with weaving. And as um, uh, color agents were less uh, strong than the older ones, the, col <coughs> Sorry. the color faded uh, earlier mm. than the original ones. Mm. That's why the bottom parts mm. are clearer mm. than, the, than the rest of the tapestries. Mm. During World, World War II, uh, there was another conservation uh, period uh, during which it, uh, it was mainly very small uh, repairs, I would say, very delicate, very small ones. And at uh, uh, the end of 20th century, beginning of this century, we began we began to realize that uh, uh, there were some deformations, that there was some uh, dust inside the fiber, mm -hmm. fibers, mm -hmm. fibers, fibers, fibers of uh, the tapestries. And we had uh, expertise by restorers specialized in uh, textile and mm -hmm. mainly tapestries. And they recommended uh, to have a conservation plan including washing the tapestries. So the restoration itself was done inside the museum. Mm -hmm. The restorers worked in the museum, but for the cleaning um, mm -hmm. period, they went to this uh, place in Belgium, in Mechelen, where they have a special place for washing the tapestries with a very um, delicate and controlled uh, mm -hmm. process. And in Paris, before having the tapestries going to Mechelen, and after this cleaning process, we took color measurements with ah, our laboratory. Yes. And that's why we can uh, assure, we can be uh, certain mm. that there was no damage for the colors, mm. but at the opposite, sort of enlightening. Mm, yes, of, uh, intensified. Uh, yes, and, yes, I mean, all, all of they these. They were revealed. In a yes. Sense. I mean, all of these um, programs to maintain and res restore and maintain the tapestries clearly point to something that I know people are keen to start looking into in more detail, and that is, um, you know, really that they are given this care because of uh, a concern for them as masterpieces mm -hmm. of the Middle Ages. So I, I think maybe we should focus a little bit on just what is in those masterpieces. I know people are dying to talk about that because the sub subject of the, the stories that the tapestries tell has intrigued people for, for the decades that we've spoken about since. You've had years of scholarly research dedicated to not only the Gothic period but specifically to these tapestries. How do you feel they may have been interpreted in medieval times? Is that a, something mm. that you can assess and, and is it different from the way we might interpret them today? Mm. So that's an interesting but difficult question, yes. I would say. Maybe uh, too difficult for a Saturday <laughs> afternoon, but we can try. <laughs> so what I, ca what I can say is as far as we can um, know, discover the type of intellectual context mm. in which they were created, uh, one first has to realize that um, those were time pre-Cartesian. So yes. you have yes. the word Cartesian? A, yes, yes. pre-Cartesian moment, a, yeah. you know, a, a pre-enlightenment moment. I suppose. And in this period, um, intellectual people uh, accept and uh, integrate yes. uh, very easily the fact that to one question, you could give several answers which nowadays could seem to be opposite, yes. but for those people could go together. Yeah. For example, you could have a completely secular explanation, mm -hmm. but also a religious one. And you could have, you know, for example, uh, it's, all, it's all very often uh, um, uh, spoken about symbolism of animals, plants, mm -hmm. etc and so on. And for example, animals could have a good and a bad uh, explanation. Yes. And that's the case with the unicorn. Yes. Unicorn could be yeah. a symbol of Christ, but it could be also a symbol of uh, sin, yes. of uh, dangerosity, and yeah. of sex. Yeah. So yeah. many different uh, significations, yeah. which for people of this period don't 
fight together. But so then, yes, you've, together. You've, you've spoken about this before, about the fact that they're, never, they're rarely mutually exclusive, these sorts yeah. of understandings mm. in, so at the time. So that's the first mm. uh, element of context, I would yes. say. Yes. And another one, more focusing on this period around 1500, it's uh, truly in Europe, and I would say especially in Paris, a period during which um, uh, I would say traditional um, religious moral significations mm -hmm. were put to a very upper level, but also were um, put in balance with uh, a new uh, antique revival mm -hmm. uh, with what is sometimes called humanism. Mm -hmm. And so this combining of explanations can also explain the context of, uh, of the period and uh, namely the context of the creation of the lady and the unicorn. Mm -hmm. So those tapestries which uh, act scenes probably allegorical as mm -hmm. maybe we'll say mm -hmm. in a moment uh, can have a moral religious uh, interpretation very spiritual mm -hmm. but they can also have a, a human uh, and maybe sexual uh, mm. interpretation. So at, one has to consider fois. that, <laughs> exactly. All at the same time. It's interesting because, in fact, the, the sort of dominant um, mm. or uh, the kind of winning scholarly argument, mm. which certainly you maintain and seems quite evident to us when we look today at the tapestries, mm. uh, is this understanding of them as mm. an allegory of the senses. Yes. Uh, that has posed some problems, which we'll, we might tease out, because we tend to conceive of the senses as only five mm -hmm. today. Mm -hmm. um, perhaps, in fact, at this moment in France, there would have been a different conception. But can you tell us just a little about the, the way that, um, that you think that the senses may have been considered at that time and, uh, and appear in the tapestries? Um, so, in fact, the senses are uh, evoked in several texts all over the Middle Ages, mm -hmm. going back to mm -hmm. the period of, we call um, Le Père de l'Église, Fathers of the Church. Do you yes, have the yes, expression? Yes, not, no. not so no. much. So, yes, <laughs> beginning yes. of Christianity, yes. let's say. And all over the medieval period, so the, uh, those senses were considered as uh, uh, something very important to define the human being mm -hmm. and as a way for the human being to have contact with the uh, exterior world. Mm -hmm. You know, with touch, uh, you have a very material contact. With smell, it's a little more uh, uh, towards uh, le another level. A little more abstracted, uh, too, but perhaps. Yeah, exactly. little, yeah. uh, in between, you have taste, yes. by the way. Yes. And uh, uh, going to hearing, which is sub to um, hearing, mm -hmm. and then to sight, mm -hmm. which are the ones which help the human being to communicate with the uh, spiritual world and in the religious uh, context with, with God. So this actually becomes a, um, a bit of a, quite a common conception of a sort of hierarchy of the senses mm -hmm. then, from a more base or material t through to this perhaps more spiritual or, or, or simply abstract. Uh, I would say that you find that quite uh, evident, uh, quite uh, clearly uh, settled yes. in some intellectual, moral text, like yes. the one by um, uh, this uh, moralist Jean Gerson, yes. which was very famous as a predicator mm. uh, at the beginning of 15th century, so and whose texts were still uh, um, known uh, around 1500. So this was, these were often these um, conceptions of a sort of uh, group of senses that needed to be governed and controlled. Um, yes. As, uh, from a sort of moral position, Elizabeth is referring to um, Jean Gerson, who is not well known in the English-speaking world, world, but but actually not even in French. Well. And in <laughs> French, giving sermons, but that these sermons were actually circulating at the time. So, but the the problem for us is that we are actually now looking at a suite of uh, five senses mm -hmm. identifiably, uh, all of which have a. And a, a, a sort of an attribution, a symbolic attribution at their heart, which would point to touch, which would point to the idea of taste and to sight and so on. And we can see that fairly readily. But this seems over the last century, 
or a little less, to have posed a considerable problem, which is then what does the six tapestry mean yeah. in relation to the senses? Can you unpack that a little bit for us, yes. Elizabeth? Yes, so if we go on with this interpretation of uh, the tapestries as allegories of the five senses, the sixth one uh, either comes from another set, and uh, it was yep. the hypothesis yep. of someone, Possibly, yeah. of some people, yeah. either you have to try to uh, figure out what this uh, sixth sense is. And the writings of Jean Gerson and some other uh, moralists of the period can help for that, since, uh, for example, they say that there is a sixth sense, which is the heart, which is at the top of the others. And if you are a human being trying to live with a moral sense and with spirituality, you have to control your five senses. And the sixth one helps you to control the five. Indeed. So that's a very, that's a spiritual yes. interpretation. But uh, does, does this tapestry appear to you to be, what, what are the indicators, what are the signs within the sixth tapestry that it might be speaking about the yes, heart? The, the gesture of the lady, which that was all a debate, does, is she choosing jewels or putting back jewels? But anyhow, this uh, moment with uh, jewels, which are sort of a symbol of the material life, yes. um, just uh, uh, in front, devant, be yes, behind? Just, no, no, in front. In so front just of the, this tent with yeah. mon seul désir, my only desire, which to say is that in, in this moral interpretation, in this uh, intellectual interpretation, a desire to go in a more spiritual world. And again, we can have the other explanation, which is the human desire of love. Yes. And both can be combined. And in fact, uh, right at the, the uh, after a couple of centuries of discussion about um, the traditions of chivalrous or courtly love yes. as well, so that um, romantic love and uh, carnal exactly. or erotic love seem to have been fractured a little bit or, or strangely, perversely spoken about. But they're represented in, in some respect there as well. Yes. yes. And you know, in this world which was still uh, controlled by Christianity, or I would say that uh, Christianism tried to control, mm -hmm. of course you had also uh, places, means of escaping, yes. for escaping this Control, rigid world. control, and of course mm. the images with this those um, interpretations yes. uh, uh, could help, could be Indeed, made for that. Isn't that fascinating that one can almost imagine um, various circumstances of looking at the tapestries, even within their architectural yes. space, that yes. at different moments one might give them different readings, so that um, exactly. certainly, as we know, they represent the family who would have commissioned them um, quite clearly simply as a sort of em emblematic or heraldic sort of sign. So were an important visitor passing, that would be perhaps significance not level one. Mm -hmm. But that presumably after dinner when telling stories, <laughs> we might actually yeah. lean towards the more erotic reading. Is that yeah, how you not? see it? Why, why not? not? Yeah. <laughs> and you know those uh, millfleur backgrounds, yeah. all that also is sort of... Uh, uh, atmosphere, creating an yes, atmosphere. an atmosphere. And in fact, you point there to an interesting thing that the setting for these, I mean, if you're speaking about potentially having a little bit of release um, from the strictures of a, a strongly religious um, yeah. sort of uh, institution, effectively, uh, and a release within images, it's interesting that the context for the lady and the unicorn is actually also a garden and it was a, an enclosed garden that we exactly. see circled by a rose trellis in one of the pieces, so very clearly indicated as such. That was also the space for telling stories, for exactly. enacting courtship rituals, for meeting lovers. So that is the space in which we meet them as well, isn't yeah. it? No. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, what I'm interested in as well, Elizabeth, is uh, since Elizabeth has been here, which is a couple of days, and she's been generously giving us every minute of her attention since then, but it is that um, 
You've spoken about two things that I'm really interested in in relation to the tapestries. Let's not forget that this is somebody who has devoted her life to academic research in relation to the, this period. And yet you say that you hope that people's imaginations will actually run quite free in relation to the interpretation of the works. Um, why do you think that's important that people allow their imaginations to work um, with these? I think that that's, uh, I do think that that's something to, uh, to see with uh, just what our job is. What our job uh, is. Mm. Our job as museum curator is to take care of the works, mm. but also to show them to the people, to the visitors, to mm. everyone who wants to um, enjoy them. Mm. And uh, not only for um, knowing, uh, for uh, uh, learning, facts learning facts and all of this sort of thing. But also just for pleasure, and yes. for what we call in French, uh, appropriation. Uh, ah, yes, to uh, actually take them on board, in yes, fact, in some and, uh, way, and own them. The, the link between a work of art and, mm -hmm. uh, and a human being is something which is uh, individual. individual. So you can enjoy uh, in a group, mm -hmm. but the, the relationship you have with the work, I think, is, is individual, is personal. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it's powerful. Job, yes, yes, it's powerful, and our job is to create the conditions mm. to allow each one to develop that. And, and after all, as you've also suggested in, the, in a, a couple of moments ago, ultimately we don't know, so we also can't yes, impose. Yes, there is also that. So, yes. um, mm. but, but the interesting, the tail end to not only letting one's imagination run, run riot with works that are loaded with symbology, is that Elizabeth has spoken in the last couple of days several times to the hope that people are in fact moved by them. Yeah. So there's something that within them and certainly within your aims as a curator uh, to, to allow people to feel the emotion of the work, not just the facts of the work. This is, yeah. Yes, it's true that what I said is easier to do with some works than with yes. some other ones. And the fact that there are six tapestries telling stories all together, but also each one its own one. Yes. Uh, this beauty, because it's, it's a matter of beauty. It is a matter uh, of beauty. <laughs> so, yeah. of course, uh, I think that's uh, I don't look totally moving. Absolutely moving. And we want moving. to share that with the people. Yeah. Yeah. And we already have. I think um, we, had a, we had an opening here last night that I'm sorry not all of you could be at, um, but we were fairly crowded as we were. And I think that certainly was the response, including from some contemporary artists who are attached to the side of the exhibition, that they came out completely moved by, um, I think, the beauty, as you say, the serenity, certainly, of the woman, the mm. mysteries within them, but at the very heart, absolutely, the beauty of the works. So um, what I'd like to do is say at that moment, I think, that the I want to thank Elizabeth not only for revealing that key element to us, which is that ultimately we're looking at objects of great beauty and great richness, um, but also to thank her for her years of scholarship on such an object and for her care and dedication from her team. And what I'd also like to do uh, from one gallery to another is to wish her the very, very best um, when she's through her renovations, when the Lady in the Unicorn is back home and can be settled into its new site um, in Paris, surrounded by effectively a great new building. So can you all join me in thanking Elizabeth today? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>